Hello and welcome. It's lovely to have you with us today at to the Superturn US East webinar on the formula to successful deal origination strategies. My name is Catherine Bond. I'm the conference director for the event. Before I introduce you to our moderator for the session, just to let you know that you can ask questions at any point. There is a Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen, so please do ask your questions and we will do our best to answer them. So I'm delighted to introduce the moderator for the webinar, which is Alex Abel. He's a partner at RCP Advisors, and he will introduce the rest of his panel. So Alex, over to you. Thank you. Um, so uh, just to give you a quick introduction on me, I'm Alex Abel. I'm a partner at RCP Advisors. RCP is a private equity fund of funds platform with a little over six and a half billion dollars of assets under management. Uh, we have a particular focus on the middle market and the lower middle market um, and uh, buyout and growth equity strategies uh, within that market uh, in the United States and North America in general. Um, we have a great group of folks today. We have two GPs that will be joining us today, Brian Miller and Gus Alberelli. Um, and then Al Kim from the uh, Helmsley Charitable Trust, who will join me as uh, a fellow limited partner on this panel. And I'll very quickly uh, sort of turn over to each member, uh, maybe we'll start with Al, to just talk a little bit about each of your organizations. Al? Thanks. Um, so Al Kim from the Helmsley Charitable Trust. Uh, Helmsley is a private foundation based in New York. Uh, we have uh, about a $6 million uh, portfolio of, of assets uh, managed across uh, various asset classes, and uh, we have a 12-person investment team, and I co-lead the, uh, the manager uh, sourcing and research and portfolio management effort uh, on the team. Great. Thank you. Brian, uh, maybe tell us a little about, about you and your background in Linden Capital Partners. Sure. Thanks, Alex. Um, Linden is a healthcare exclusive private equity firm based in Chicago. We focus on uh, LBOs, uh, not growth investments, um, and we do that across the entire healthcare spectrum. So we're one of the few healthcare exclusive firms that also does pharma, medical products, distribution, diagnostics, services, for example. Uh, we are an outgrowth of the old uh, First Chicago JP Morgan Bank One, where the old healthcare team spun out. We just raised our fourth fund uh, with $1.5 billion announced this month, uh, which I believe makes us the largest healthcare exclusive fund raised. Uh, and our strategy focuses, as you can see, uh, on being industry exclusive, working closely with operating partners, so former CEOs uh, and division presidents of healthcare companies that then advise us, uh, value creation planning, uh, and we can talk about that a little later, and lastly, a, a large focus on human capital um, internally. Great, thank you. Um, Gus, can you tell us a little bit about Sunstone? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Gus Albrelli. Uh, I'm with Sunstone Partners, one of the four uh, co-founders and managing directors. We are uh, a spin-out of a group called Trident Capital. Uh, we were founded in 2015, but have the majority of us have been working together since 2005 as a group. Uh, in 2015, we spun out and raised our uh, first, first fund of just over $300 million uh, focused on growth equity and growth buyouts of technology-enabled services. There's a couple core sectors that we focus on within that. We'll talk about that later today. Um, but our sweet spot is investing in companies that are in the 10 to $50 million range uh, within tech-enabled services where we are the first institutional capital. Uh, so these are companies uh, not distressed by any means that are growing 20 to 40 percent, often founder own, uh, that are looking for a partner either as a minority deal uh, or as a majority buyer uh, that will help them uh, continue scaling their business to 100, 200, and beyond. Um, these uh, companies are focused exclusively uh, in U.S. and Canada. That's where we uh, that's where we invest, uh, and they tend to be uh, by definition because they have not raised venture capital. Uh, by necessity, they have to be uh, break-even or profitable. Great. Thank you, Gus. Um, 
So what I want to start with today, uh, we're talking about sourcing um, and strategies for successful sourcing, but I think it would be great to get sort of a, everybody sort of a level set um, what the environment's like today uh, as it comes to sourcing deals. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you guys, for, for the two GPs, will be uh, what you, you're experiencing as deal sourcers yourselves and then your organization's deal sourcing. Uh, Al and me, we can sort of throw in our two cents based on what we see within our portfolio GPs as well as folks that we're meeting with as, we, uh, as people go through fundraising. But on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, 10 being the most difficult environment you've ever operated in, ever, and 1 being the easiest one, where would you put the current sourcing environment? I'll start off with uh, Gus. We'll have you sort of lead us. Sure. So I, I entered the buy side in 2003, right after the dot-com crash, um, and so have seen a little um, – uh, in the past 15 years, I've seen definitely prices creep up. I'm assuming that will be a, a theme that we end up talking about on this call. But I, I would actually say from a ability to source uh, a company to actually get a founder uh, to sell right now, whether it's a minority or majority, uh, is actually you know, surprisingly easy. The, the, the challenge will be the bid-ask spread. Um, but, but everyone knows that now is a good time to sell, or at least the perception certainly is that now is a good time to sell. So certainly in 2009-10, it was actually pretty tough to convince a founder CEO who you know, owns his business, if he's, unless he's you know, run into some sort of uh, you know, trouble situation for some reason, uh, you know, they just said, hey, we'll, we'll wait it out. Um, and and you know, the good news is we're focused on kind of the, the bottom part of the pyramid. There's a lot of companies. Um, so, you know, during the, the days like 2009 and 2010, it's, you know, kind of working with the ones that are, that are experiencing growth that for whatever reason uh, want to, you know, take some chips off the table or, you know, they want to supercharge some growth or they want to acquire a competitor that has run into trouble and they need some additional capital to do it. In this current market environment now, it's it's almost the opposite, right? I mean, you really have to. Everyone's willing to sell at a high price, uh, so you have to figure out what's your angle uh, to potentially, you know, source a deal at a at a more attractive valuation, or if you're going to chin up to a market valuation, you know, what is your angle to, you know, create a, create a strong return for for you and your LPs. So uh, the reality is when we're focused on certain subsectors, cybersecurity as an example is one that I focus on. Um, you know, we believe that's kind of a long-term trend and, uh, and we've got a network of relationships. So, you know, we're looking for companies within specific subsectors there that we think will continue, uh, you know, being strong categories even if there is a, a hiccup, uh, you know, or, or maybe even a recession in the future. Uh, you know, there's still going to be recession-resistant areas. If you're investing in a strong business with recurring revenues, you should be able to come out the other end. Um, so I, I'd say on a scale of 1 to 10, Alex, probably, you know, maybe a, a 6. That's interesting. So, it, it, so I imagine as part of that, you mentioned the bid-ask spread that was occurring during the, the financial crisis and the ability to sort of get people to sell today. Do you think that the narrowing of that bid-ask spread has been a function of GP's willingness to move up in what they're willing to pay for the same companies? Has, has the I do. GP I, I moved do. More, than the, more than the sellers? <laughs> I, yes, I think I think uh, depending on which side of that equation you're on, that, that's unfortunate from the GP side. Well, maybe also from the LP side. The entrepreneurs seem to be pretty happy. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think I think there's a there's a school of thought out there right now, which is well, you know, every time there's a recession, there's usually happy days in the future. So uh, you know, if if people had been investing in 2009, 2010, they'd be delighted right now. So you know, even if even if the price is really high, the entrepreneur is demanding a high price, if it's a good asset, I'll just chin up and pay for it because even if there is a recession in the future, I'll come out the other end because it's such a strong company that, you know, eventually I'll make my money and might just take six, seven years instead of, you know, three, four, five. I, you know, sure. I, I don't know if I totally buy that, uh, but that, that is certainly what I've heard uh, other people say. Brian, let's go to you. What, what, how do you view this environment in relation to your, your sort of experience historically? Sure. Uh, and, I mean, I, uh, maybe I'll start with the number and, and, and 
talk about how I arrived there. And I, I put it around a seven because if, if you actually look at the, the results uh, to our investors, we were able to invest our third $750 million fund in about two years. So as far as sourcing resulting in, you know, investing capital, it's uh, it's been a good environment. But if I compare it to, you know, 20 years ago when I started in PE, um, the only reason, if, if we were following that model that at the time was what is now, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, um, I would put it in absolute 10 because we were generalists and uh, sort of just starting a healthcare team. And I think that model would be absolutely to 10, but what we've done is by restricting what we're looking for, and we've done that in two iterations, one, by first becoming healthcare exclusive, and then second, by creating subsector teams within our fund that almost operate like their own mini fund as far as consistent staffing, their own meetings, um, their own approach to sourcing, pushed down to that level to where we've really restricted the deals we, we want to look at, where we know we have an angle ahead of time. That's really enabled my sourcing score to come back down because otherwise uh, I think it'd just be maxed out at probably the most difficult environment possible. That's helpful to understand. Al, you know, sort of taking Brian's theme, maybe if you have a number uh, of what you see, but also, you know, maybe uh, building on what Brian said, you know, uh, we as limited partners are looking at both specialists and generalists and, you know, everything sort of in between that spectrum. Um, both Gus and Brian happen to be specialists in terms of the private equity investments they're making. Al, do you see a difference in how challenging this environment is for, let's say, traditional LBO generalists versus folks that are focused on very specific sectors or subspectors? Um, yeah, so um, like Helmsy only invests, or you know, to date we've only invested in um, the, the generalists, so kind of multi-sector buyout funds, uh, the buyout space, um, and. If, if I had to put a number on it, um, I would say um, probably around seven, right? So ten being the most difficult. Um, and I say that you know I'm kind of, I, from my perspective, I'm I'm using uh, the amount of capital called from the managers that they're actually deploying and and, and calling, right? Um, if you look, if I look across the buyout managers that I have. Um, you know, there's there's definitely a few that are steadily investing and consistently calling capital based on what they uh, marketed to us. Um, but there's definitely, um, I would say, more uh, that have been slower to call than than, than expected. Um, it, you know, I'm kind of looking down at, at my sheet. You know, I still have a 2011 buyout fund that's still only 65% called. <laughs> And we're you know seven, seven years in, right? Um, and and so um, you know my numbers again closer to you know closer to seven versus you know closer to being closer to one. Yeah, I think that's I think that's definitely where I stand as well. And you know one of the reasons you know we, we were talking about um, and I just threw up another slide up here on the on the board here. This is. Uh, Data that um, on the left side is from RCP actually on middle market, lower middle market purchase price multiples. Uh, the right side uh, is from S&P Global um, as it's really representing larger deals, the top part of the market. And you know, for us, I think seven, eight is sort of where I would put it. Um, and I think that what makes it, I agree totally with Alan that we've said we've had several managers uh, that have had the ability to put capital work pretty steadily over the last couple of years, and some that are not. And then the question becomes, um, you know, is it quality versus quantity? Right? That's something we're always sort of concerned about. You know, just because people are putting money to work, you know, are they doing it in, in the right deals um, uh, that have the chance to generate good returns? Or, which is certainly a concern by a lot of LPs, is uh, are, are people paying up for the same assets and the same cash flow at prices that might be uh, certainly not sustainable in the long run? And so these are, these are two charts that I think are sort of interesting to sort of frame the market environment right now on the left. Um, the top line is enterprise value above $75 million. Uh, so these are pretty small companies still. Um, the bottom line is enterprise value under $75 million, which is really the lower middle market. And when you compare both of those charts and, uh, and compared to what's going on at, at sort of larger companies, you, know, you see 
you know, somewhere between two to three turns or lo- or higher difference between different parts of the structurally different parts of the market in terms of what purchase price multiples are. Now, some of this is natural due to the size of the companies, the efficiency of those markets. But the rise that we've seen in the top part of the market, we think, has been sort of uh, much more steady than we've seen at the very low end of the market. Um, and uh, it, it, we think it's certainly a function of um, a more efficient market, but also a function of the amount of capital that's been raised um, and that, you know, thus, and thus needed to be put to work. Um, but I guess one question I have for the GPs as it relates to both the purchase prices that people are paying and their own processes is, is you know, Brian, you mentioned, for example, that you guys have been able to put money to work pretty steadily. Has it been at the same hit rate historically to the deals that you've sort of engaged in versus closed? Um, one of the things that we hear a lot from GPs is that it is just a more competitive market and more players with lots of capital willing to stretch. Um, how has your hit rate been, depending on, I don't know how you measure it internally, is it, you know, IOIs compared to transactions completed? Um, give me a sense for sort of what you're seeing from that. Sure. Um, you know, I would say in the long run, it's been it's been quite consistent, uh, as I think in a general level, you know, we've we've continued to hone our strategy, you know, a bit ahead of the market, as, as you probably know. There's only a, a handful of sizable healthcare exclusive PE funds out of the 4,000, you know, overall PE funds. So we're, we're kind of unique in what we do to start with. Um, but there, there was one shift that occurred, uh, I'd say, three, four years ago, where we had a, a kind of quiet year where uh, every year we see around called 300-ish deals uh, that would fit in, fit generally in our mandate. Um, and we'd been closing on you know two to four per year, but we had one year that became quite quite slow. Um, we put in a number of IOIs, but you know, we weren't winning the auctions basically. And there had just been a bit of a shift in the market where people were running ahead, uh, spending capital uh, in more competitive processes, and um, I think we were just uh, at that time maybe a, a, a bit. Um, slow to jump on that train, and so uh, shifted our strategy to just get, you know, more aggressive in the few auctions we decided to participate in, because there aren't many proprietary deals at the, the size we're going after, uh, on, you know, notwithstanding tuck-ins, but the, the shift in the strategy was to, I would say, decide quicker whether to go hard on a transaction or not, and once, you know, that, that tweak was made, we went right back to our, our typical um, investment rate. And so, uh, what, in terms of the the, uh, the the decision to go hard quicker, how is how has that changed your process, your decision making process internally, and how does it change sort of how you guys screen and triage deals, um, just from a process standpoint within your organization? Uh, sure. I, I don't know if it changes the way we do it. Um, it, it changes probably the decision point to. You know, once we know that something is coming up for sale, um, whether we have conviction in that sector to start with and then that specific company. Because there, there's a bit of – it's a whole purpose for the subsector teams, right? The, the goal is to, frankly, already know a company coming up for sale before they hire an investment banker, before they decide on a process. And that's the goal of a multi-year effort in a subsector to, to know all these potential targets. Um, then, in theory, we already know which ones we're really targeting as the best assets uh, or the ones at least we feel like our value creation plan will have the highest impact on our returns. So the best assets for Linden. By doing all of that, once the company is ready for a process, um, we are then able to engage early. I think when many, for example, generalists are still you know, reading industry reports or calling uh, Frost and Sullivan to you know, buy the general report that probably is of no use to us anymore because we're well beyond it, and we're hitting the ground, basically already conducting more tactical diligence when some of our generalist competitors are just kicking off, call it industry diligence. And I think that we hear that from sellers in you know how our first meetings go, uh, not only from showing up with people they already know from the industry, uh, that gives them a level of comfort, uh, but also the types of questions we're asking in our first meetings. So with that, uh, uh, and then, then yeah, we get a lot more granular early, and we can say, yes, you know, let's go full speed, full spend, and, and be ready for, you know, the final bid date with something 
completely baked. Right. And Gus, Gus, similar to what, as Brian said, you know, as a sector specialist, now you, you're focusing on much smaller companies than what Brian's fund does, um, but also, but also in a very competitive um, space in technology and technology-enabled services, things like that. How do you guys think about the strategy that you guys entail in um, trying to source and specifically win deals? Especially when you, you know, for you guys, you may be dealing in a auction process or non-auction process, but you're you're going to be dealing uh, in most cases with some sort of entrepreneur owner uh, of a lot of these companies. How do you guys win win deals and, and find them uh, in a you know, so it's called very rarely proprietary market? Sure. So similar, uh, echoing a little bit of what Brian said, you know, we, we have subsector teams, and I'll just pick cybersecurity since that's the one that I head up together with one of my partners. You know, within cybersecurity, we've probably got at any given time probably six or seven themes and subsectors within cybersecurity that we're tracking. Um, and so, you know, the reality is we are trying to get to know these companies well before they hire a process and ideally trying to preempt any process. But I think it goes to one of the comments that he said, which is, you know, as a sector specialist, when you are in those meetings, whether it's a first meeting in an unbanked, uh, you know, just introduction meeting, or whether it's the first meeting in a, in a formal auction process, you, you don't have to spend a ton of time, you know, understanding or getting up to speed on, well, why is this company growing? Why is this subsector interesting in the short term and then ideally in the long term? We, we actually already have a market map where we're, we're kind of believers in that, and oftentimes we've gone out and targeted the company. And so, uh, you know, when we are able to, you know, convince entrepreneurs, and oftentimes it's situations where, um, you know, they have a co-founder that's not interested in, in continuing with the business, uh, and so, you know, maybe they're not as valuation sensitive uh, or, or they're not selling a majority of their company. I think if they are looking to do a, a full, you know, 100% sale, uh, you know, I think one of the trends that has definitely happened even in, in the smaller end of the market is if you're looking to sell 100% of your business, uh, you, you, you do see more and more of those companies just select a banker and, and do an auction process, whether it's a full-blown, you know, 500, you know, PE outreach, including strategics or not, you know, put that aside. But they hire a banker, they do some semblance of a, of a sale process. Uh, and 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 that that typically is what you see if they're looking to do a hundred percent sale. If it is a minority deal, or or you know there's other dynamics where maybe you can uh, get yourself over fifty percent, but they really care who the partner is. Uh, they you know the industry specialization and and their ability uh, or your ability to convince them that you're the right partner for them to help grow their business to the next level. So, so we've got two kind of sides to our sourcing strategy. One of them is the thematic side uh, that I just described, but the other one is uh, we do uh, take a little bit of, um, a, call it a technology-enabled service approach to identifying some of these companies. We're, as you mentioned, we're operating in a segment where, uh, you know, there is there is some froth in, in the technol overall technology sector, um, but there are a lot of companies. And so, one of the things that we were trying to identify is how do we sort through all of these companies uh, to, to focus on the ones that we know are growing? Uh, and, and some of our predecessor firms, you know, historically have done that through a very dedicated, proactive outreach, you know, kind of cold calling effort with 20-year-olds just banging on the phones and, and, and contacting companies. Uh, we, we invested in a little bit of technology and, and have tweaked certain things with analytics uh, so that, you know, before picking up the phone, uh, or, or trying to get a warm introduction, there's only one opportunity to get a, you know, there's only one opportunity to make a first impression. And a 20-something year old cold calling your CEO is, is often not it. And so one of the things that we do is we focus on a core subsector of companies. We then validate that it's growing through our growth index model that we've developed. And then we get a warm introduction to that founder CEO or C-level executive. And oftentimes in that first meeting, we literally are presenting to them almost like we were, uh, you know, on the sales side, you know, almost an investment banker type of, you know, pitch where it's like, here's why you should work with us. Obviously, we're on the buy side and, you know, we're, we're selling our expertise. But um, that, that's how we've identified it. It's a combination of thematic approach combined with kind of a data-driven analytics approach where uh, we're able to kind of screen through the, you know, 
kind of the haystack of, of companies out there and ideally uh, use a magnet to, to find the needle in there and, and the high growth companies. That's really helpful. Um, you know, Al, it looks like me and you might have to uh, talk for the generalists of the GP world um, a little bit. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put in my two cents as well. But Al, I was wondering if you could maybe talk through, you know, you mentioned that you had a number of managers that have been pretty successful in putting money to work um, versus some that have not. Um, what have you seen in terms of differences in strategies that the generalists are are taking, um, you know, as we've had two sector specialists you know, sort of pitching the edge that they have against generalists. Um, what do you think that the generalists have been doing that you've seen that have been successful, and where are the where are the strategies where you feel like they're struggling, if if any? I'll make sure you're not on mute. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so <laughs> Sorry. I think. I think where the managers um, are struggling is, you know, goes to your point about valuation, right? Because uh, entry point, um, you know, into, you know, these businesses is so crucial, right? And so, um, you know, you pointed to the valuation slide you had before where you had, you know, the smaller deals, uh, the lower middle market deals, and then the, the, the larger deals. I mean, but in all, in, in all the different, you know, sizes, everything is trending up, right? And so where I've seen, um, you know, some of my managers struggle or, you know, some of the some of their underlying investments is wait, where they, they are paying up, right? Uh, because that just makes it so much harder. Um, um, I guess where I see, you know, some of the trends I've seen from, from our managers and uh, where they're, where they're not paying up, I mean, is you know one of the trends is they they they're going for smaller deals right so you know you mentioned like the 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 two turn uh gap uh on multiples for like the smaller deals so some of the larger managers that we have um they're doing a lot of you know buying you know some of these smaller businesses and doing a bunch of different add on acquisitions right so kind of you know buying the platform companies and building up Right. And so I think those, um, you know, they're doing that because, um, you know, the multiples are lower um, and it also gives them optionality uh, to, to be able to build if, if they're successful in finding uh, acquisitions for them to do. Right. Sure. Um, another another thing I've seen from managers is, um, you know, and and this comes, you know, this helps address you know, investing in this uh, expensive environment is, you know, however you want to call it, like, you know, structured equity, right? Where, you know, they're not taking, uh, you know, they're, they're sharing, they're taking less, they're still buying uh, majority stakes in these companies, but they're not buying as much as they would have bought before, but they're structuring some of the, the, the equity in, you know, in the form of debt where they're clipping, you know, high, high coupons uh, but but sharing more of the ownership with the, the original business owners, and so um, and the and the thesis behind that clearly is, you know, we're later in a cycle, uh, and you know, clipping, uh, you know, clipping interest payments on uh, in the in the low double digits helps de-risk your equity investment, um, uh, you know as we get later into a cycle, right? And so that's that's sure. another thing up from some of our managers. Yeah, I think that we've seen the same thing. I think that, you know, one of the things that we've seen a lot of the folks that, that deal with multiple sectors within their funds um, do as they try to sell, similar to how Brian and Gus described, sort of, you know, trying to win over the sellers in some ways, sometimes by their own expertise in those areas. Sometimes it's with... Um, the structure of the deal, right, and how they're willing to, to structure certain deals uh, for an owner. So, for example, you know, there are groups that we know and have invested in who are very focused on finding only, um, let's say, entrepreneur owner, family owned businesses that want significant rollover. Uh, so they want to take a second bite of the apple. They don't want to be pushed out. They don't want to be replaced as the management team. Um, and for privately firms that might focus on that type of strategy, once I, once they are able to identify companies that fit that, they have an 
hedge against a lot of other potential buyers who uh, maybe don't come with that option for you know an existing management team and owner. Um, you know, the other thing I think that generalists have the ability to do is shift areas of focus um, based on what is happening in the market. So one of the things that we've certainly seen is that purchase price multiples while this chart sort of obviously shows it up and to the right, you know, not every sector is the same, right? So this is a, a very sector-specific chart that I've, I've just pushed to the audience here. Um, and I don't have the label of what sector it is and sort of like be fun to sort of guess what this is. But, you know, this is, this is one sector that we've, we've tracked a significant number of data points on, purchase price multiples over time. Um, and then this is another one that is a couple turns higher, right, and, and has seen an increase to almost 10 times in the middle, lower middle market. Um, this chart is for industrials, right, and we've seen industrials rise from, you know, 4.9 turns uh, in 2009, staying mostly in the mid-sixes until uh, sort of an interesting pop of uh, almost a turn higher on the deals that we track last year. Um, while healthcare um, has seen multiples, obviously, that have increased pretty steadily over the last eight years and are you know, sort of, let's say, structurally significant higher. So, you know, for us at least, you know, what we see a lot of the generals are able to do is sort of dip in and out of certain areas, and they have a disadvantage in some ways because of that. But they also have the advantage to sort of allocate capital to areas they think might be less or more efficient. And so, um, in the interest of not picking on healthcare, I'm going to actually let Brian sort of talk a little bit to this chart because um, while healthcare has traditionally had higher multiples in a lot of other sectors, there are some sort of reasons for that. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, I mean, the, the quick overlay is you'll, you'll see, and in, in I think every year, healthcare has been more expensive than, than industrials, and healthcare deals have historically tended to be so uh, higher than the general, you know, P.E. average uh, LBO. Now, the, you ask the reasons why. I think you've got an overall trend that has been true, you know, in every sim that I've looked at in 20 years, which is the demographics push, right? The baby boomers are coming in. Older folks uh, consume a disproportionate percentage of the healthcare dollars. And so that's going to drive just continued um, demand for the overall industry. So what that results in is a above average estimate for GDP for healthcare growth versus GDP. And the most recent figures, you know, I think had the 2020 estimates on national health at five or six percent, whereas real GDP growth is at two percent, coming out of uh, the Bureau of Labor Stats. Uh, in addition, it is uh, relatively recession resistant, and you had the the big test of that through the Great Recession, and you're kind of picking up the back end of that uh, on healthcare when we were down uh, at 6.8 here. Uh, I think that that was probably one of the larger gaps, 6.8 versus 4.9 on multiples um, as a percentage, because industrials obviously are not recession resistant and were taken out on the chin at that time. Um, what does not show up on that chart that I recall from, from that period was it also overlapped with uh, the debate on the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, as it's, it's more popularly known. And it was a bit of a nuclear winner for healthcare investing because as, as that size, seismic potential shift to the healthcare economy was being debated almost down to a single payer system, the number of healthcare service deals, which is the bulk of the healthcare um, LBO deal flow, it's more than half is the service, uh, service side of LBO investing in healthcare, uh, really dried up. And so you'll see, you see the multiples there, but what you don't see is there wasn't much capital put to work. And so now, obviously, multiples are higher. Um, you do have a, a relatively steady outcome on uh, Obamacare not being able to be overturned by the Trump administration. And so you've now entered what I would call a steady state of uh, consistent growth and some, regula some, some relatively calm on the regulatory front. And the uninsured that came into the system, another 20 million individuals, uh, you know, coming in during the time of this chart uh, seems to be here to stay. So that's just a summary on uh, uh, a little bit of the, the healthcare LBO environment over the past uh, nine years. That's helpful. Um, 
So let me move away from sort of the discussion about sort of the valuation environment just for a second. And let's talk about, I mean, one of the goals of this, this session is to sort of help provide some sort of insights into how you guys think about sort of sourcing. And, and um, you know, Brian, I think actually both Brian and Gus sort of mentioned this idea that of trying to sort of get an edge on these companies and these deals before they're even brought to market, right? And and so I guess one of the questions I have for, for the two GPs is, and, and we can start with, with Brian, um, you know, what, how do you do that, um, both from a process point of view, from a human resources point of view? So, for example, do you have people in-house that are primarily responsible for business development, sourcing, that type of thing? Are the partners that are the investment deal team leads doing it? Is everybody doing it? How do you sort of think about that from a sort of internal process point of view to make sure you're finding these companies um, and getting ahead of them before they come to market? Um, and what would be some of the sort of, you know, uh, sort of tips and, and sort of warnings that you would give to, let's say, maybe less experienced GPs, uh, some of the lessons that you've learned in, in how to structure a sourcing sort of strategy? I'll start with Brian. Sure. And let's take the uh, – well, I'm guessing we'll follow up with how to create the angle, but just on the – because I view that as very different than just having the deal come in the door. You know, are you really ready for it? There, there are obviously – Yeah, I mean, why don't you talk about that, those two different parts, right? So yeah. just creating the funnel, and then the second part is um, making sure that you are the one that is the preferred buyer. Well, let, let, let me split the funnel and the preferred, and, and if I spend too much time talking about the funnel, we can we can pop back to the angles with, with everybody else. But So on the sourcing front, we do, I would say, what is the – standard investment banker coverage, um, you know, using Salesforce.com, you know, splitting out who are the active banks, really tiering it into A, Bs, and Cs, and making sure that, you know, you're, you're spending the, uh, you know, the 80-20 rule of how you spend your time on whom and developing deep relationships with the key folks. Um, that is, I think, I hope has become relatively standard across uh, PE but the execution there is the key, right? And that, that I'd say, is done across the firm, uh, not, not really driven by the subsector teams. And that ensures that we just see what's available in the market. Um, then the, I'd say the more differentiated sourcing or getting ahead of the process really falls to the subsector team. And we do not have, you know, a business development person that just sort of floats across the firm and, and, and uh, you know, makes those calls, although it's, it's something we've, we've talked about. Um, we leave it to the subsector teams because the key is for them to know that you're living in their environment on a daily basis. And those teams, well, you know, it's not just a six-month shot at a sector. We're talking about multi-year, long-term efforts. You know, our, our mid-level professionals are building their careers around sectors where they're supposed to be at all the events. You know, they're supposed to be seen at all the, um, you know, cocktail parties and recruiting events and get to know the executives and not just the CEOs of the public companies, but the private companies, the board members, um, the consultants, the lawyers that, that um, cater to them and really be part of that environment um, so that, again, when the, the deal comes up, we have a pretty intimate knowledge of, of that company. But they're, they're accompanied by and partnered at the hip with an operating partner who day one has already spent their entire career decades in that sector and you know, has all those connections to bring into Linden. And so uh, one of the things we've realized is you know, there are so many PE firms calling on so many non-core divisions and so many privately held businesses that for a CEO or a CFO to get yet another phone call from a post-MBA saying, hi, I'm from XYZ firm, we'd really like to sit down and talk to you about your strategy, is not that differentiated anymore. I think that worked for certain firms 15 years ago, and you had the call centers of analysts, you know, paying people. Um, now it's more likely that we would rely on a, a joint phone call or a, you know, an email to a friend from an operating partner to an executive saying, hey, yeah, you know, just saw XYZ. You know, I've known you 20 years. Why don't we sit down and, and have coffee, and I'll tell you a little bit about Linden. That's a much more effective intro, and it revolves around the whole team sort of working together but leveraging an operating partner's, you know, 20, 30 years in a sector being a, a leading figure in that sector. So that, that tends you, to tee us up well for, you know, if and when the property comes to auction. And, Brian, just to follow up on one part of what you were talking about, 
Um, you mentioned you Salesforce.com. So, you know, are you, you, you guys have a systematic um, process internally for how you divvy up. I mean, you obviously mentioned the subsectors, but like we're each individual, even within those subsectors or sub areas, have lists of CEOs, intermediaries, contacts, whatever, however you guys want to define it, that they are supposed to be on a regular basis pinging, and is that monitored and tracked by folks internally? How how structured is the process versus um, uh, you know sort of uh, letting folks uh, sort of do it on their own? Um, great question. The the subsector teams uh, do it on their own, but it gets logged and reports up to. Uh, the entire firm, so that at our quarterly meeting for the entire firm, we actually post our sourcing statistics. How many deals did we see? How many and how many NDAs did we sign? How many initial bids did we put in? How many meetings did we take? Right, uh, and it's actually measured against our targets. We want a certain percentage um, to be within our preordained sectors. We also have a certain amount that is opportunistic deal flow, where it just happened. We, we actually find out, wow. This is something we didn't have a sector effort, but we're really well qualified and prepared to go after this asset. We do have an angle. Um, and so we actually balance that mix of, um, call it, you know, um, targeted flow versus more surprise deal flow, and then what percentage make it through to what part of the funnel. And that's a, on a quarterly basis reviewed by the entire firm. And then that's the sector great. teams <laughs> also present on a quarterly basis up to the entire firm. What had their activities been? Are they seeing active deal flow? Has it just been quiet? You know, where are we spending our resources? Right. Let me switch to Gus to get his take on the funnel question, sort of how do you, how do you, you know, get the right deals coming into the funnel and how do you get the funnel robust enough so that you can find, you know, your subset of deals you want to do? You know, Gus, you mentioned a little bit about your use of technology. How, how do you guys structure your process internally for divvying up responsibilities, for coverage? You know, how are you creating sort of deal flow through that funnel? And make sure you're not on So mute. one of the things that uh, – <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so one of the things that we do uh, is very much, you know, leverage both sides of the house. And what I mean by that is we have, you know, kind of the different subsectors and the different market maps within each one of the subsectors that we're tracking. And then we have uh, kind of our data-driven, you know, growth index. Um, there's two ways, right? We can sit in our ivory tower and think we're very smart and come up with wonderful thesis areas. But then, again, we're growth investors, so we won't even touch a company unless it's growing north of 20% year over year without kind of outside investment. Uh, so if we come up with this great thesis and then we kind of go to the market and find that none of the companies are kind of big enough or none of the companies are growing north of 20%, then, you know, as smart as we think we are, we, we actually just came up with a thesis that uh, isn't currently in the market growing. So one of the things that we do is, is kind of two-sided. So... Uh, we will crowdsource a thesis sometimes, uh, almost by accident. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of look at what's happening in the market among the different companies that are bubbling up to the top of the growth index. Um, and, and these are companies that, by definition, are, you know, kind of squarely in our investment criteria, 10 to 50 of revenues, growing north of 20% within the subsectors, haven't raised outside capital. Um, and, and the reality is if a company fits that type of investment financial criteria, uh, they've, they've got to be do, doing something right. So, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, we focus on distressed companies or, uh, you know, very high growth companies. You know, at 20% in this category, uh, they often have something wrong with them because they haven't been able to maybe uh, hire the team. And I'm, I'm kind of doing this, Alex, as a, as a prelude to, uh, to kind of making sure you're the preferred partner. But, you know, oftentimes they, they've had to make sacrifices, right? So the founder CEO didn't have early stage venture capital uh, to hire the perfect team out of central casting with exactly the right backgrounds. So one of the things that we end up doing uh, as we move down, you know, kind of making sure we're the preferred partner is we will proactively actually help with recruiting uh, even before we're involved. Now, obviously, you can't do that for every company, uh, but we have kind of the what we call the SP500 list, where our kind of 500 prospects, where uh, we're very, you know, methodical about any time we're in their their city, uh, any industry reports or things that we're seeing, or actually sometimes we we come up with our own thought pieces. We will, you know, kind of get in front of them at a minimum on a quarterly basis uh, and just check in. How can we help? Whether that's helping, um, you know, 
refine their go-to-market strategy, where that's uh, you know helping them with new hires. A lot of our companies uh, at, at, at the stage that we're playing, they really need help at the CFO level. Typically, you know the receipts aren't in shoeboxes, but it's only a mild step up sometimes. And so they got to transition from a, a part-time controller, you know, finance professional, uh, to a, a real CFO that can help scale the business from where it is today to you know 50. Uh, you know, 100 million and beyond. So uh, that's one area. Another area is uh, transitioning or helping the founder CEO think through and transition from uh, a founder-led sales model to a more scalable, professionally managed, uh, you know, go-to-market strategy. Uh, and so that that might entail uh, introducing them to head of of, uh, of sales that we've worked with before in our network, uh, or or you know, it's increasingly. Uh, especially for companies that are, you know, more focused on the SMB market, uh, that, you know, as important as the sales team might be, the, a, a strong uh, marketing professional may be just as important, if not more so. Uh, and so I, I realized I kind of started shifting, but since Brian spent uh, time talking about the creating the funnel, I thought it made sense to talk a little bit about, you know, how to talk about the making sure you're the preferred partner. Because uh, I'll say in terms of the, the, the funnel, not too dissimilar from what Brian said, I, I I don't know for a fact. You, you know, I defer to the LPs on the call, uh, but I would assume that you know most people are, are using Salesforce um, and and have some you know semblance of an outbound effort. I completely agree with with what was said, which is you know the, the days of you know just being able to dial for dollars and have that be a unique sourcing strategy are unfortunately long gone. Uh, so you you do need uh, warm introductions uh, from you know someone that's close to the founder CEO or a C level executive. Uh, we, we leverage our operating partners uh, tremendously as well, uh, not just on the kind of post-investment side uh, where, you know, historically they've obviously uh, been focused on, but increasingly we're bringing them into uh, our first meetings with the companies uh, and leveraging their, their Rolodex for relationships. So uh, I think just as a, as a trend, I would say that uh, one of the reasons that we went and, and, and invested in, in building our kind of technology-enabled sourcing strategy was that, uh, you know, we, we needed a way to uh, identify companies that we knew had already fit the investment criteria to then uh, leverage the networks of the operating partners. Uh, the way a lot of firms had been doing it before was just hiring 20-something-year-olds and have them bang on the phones, making calls to then figure out if the company fit the investment criteria or not. Um, but essentially, we've shifted a lot of those sourcing uh, dollars to expanding our operating uh, partner network and, uh, and, and and investing in the technology. That's really helpful, Gus. So, um, no, go ahead, Brian. Oh, hey, Alex. I was just going to hop on and, and put the sort of Linden take on, on that human capital yeah. side and, and the Salesforce side, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how much things have evolved because uh, Salesforce was one of the first tech invest, I mean, uh, for software or, or back office investments we made when we raised the first fund. And I remember calling them uh, myself in 05, and they didn't know what PE was. They, they, they couldn't find anybody in the organization, and so we had to customize it and, and kind of, you know, wrangle it together to, to work for what we did. And, and now they have a uh, entirely, like, I think, canned PE offering. So it's, it's come quite a long way. Um, but what – you know, back then it was really used to, to track deal flow when we were so focused on, on deals. What, what has shifted uh, dramatically is this human capital effort. And I mentioned it as sort of the, the, the fourth leg of our, of our strategic stool uh, that has really emerged where we now have a full-time human capital partner um, you know, with you know, full partner role at the firm, um, expanding his own team. And we track the number of executives we meet, the resumes that come in, the sit-downs we have, what positions they could go into, and really pairing up uh, an executive with a transaction by a sector team can be a very powerful tool. And um, I'm starting to call it BYO CEO uh, as opposed to BYOB, uh, where in <laughs> four of the last six deals I've closed, I had my – the company needed a CEO – the seller admitted it. The intermediary admitted it. We had identified this person. They worked alongside us in due diligence with the commitment that they would join the company day one at closing. And when the deal closed, they went in, announced along with the transaction to run the business. And that had been extremely powerful because you have the person responsible then for delivering your return 
basically signing on during due diligence, able to ask and drive any of the key questions they like, actually getting in at a more granular level than, than typically a PE firm would. Uh, and it gives you that added certainty when you're, especially in an auction, that the seller believes, you know, why is Linden more likely to close than the next firm, right? And if, if they know you've got an executive to drive it and the next firm is going to have to, you know, is going to wait, you know, do the interim deal, um, call Corn Ferry in three weeks and hope that things work out right, you can just imagine, you know, our argument is much stronger showing up with that individual. And typically the management teams tend to lean in a little more knowing who they're who's going to be their new leader, and, and you get the, the company on your side wanting you to be the, the winner. And so if you come close or tie on valuation, um, the nod tends to go to, uh, to you if you've got more certainty. So that, that's been key for us. How, how is it, you know, we always hear as a limited partners uh, about the, uh, the ability to win deals when you're not the highest bidder. Um, and, you know, you just mentioned that, you know, if you're sort of, if there's a sort of a break the tie situation. How often do you think for either in your own anecdotal experience or amongst deals that you've, you've been involved with on the bidding process, do you think that people, that sellers will take a lower bid of some consequence, right? So it's always going to be obviously close. Um, uh, because of the edge that the given sponsor is bringing to the table, like you. Is that for Brian? Or? I mean, yeah, yeah, for you, Brian. I'll, I'll How often does that happen? I'll give it a shot, and then Gustavo will follow up. I'd say it's very <laughs> rare. I can name, you know, in the last, um, I don't know, in the last four years, I can name two where I found out that uh, we were actually outbid, but the and in both cases, they were founders, and I think that's a key difference is right. um, founders are more likely to choose somebody that they think will create more wealth, and in both cases, they were rolling over and truly believed um, that we would be the better partner for their company, and most of it revolved around a, a mix of being healthcare-specific uh, versus generalists, and uh, I'd say knowing their customers, uh, tangibly showing that we were able to add value, and then an ease and a comfort with the operating partner. Um, those those have tended to drive it, um, uh, and I think the, fam- the the privately held situation is um, is the key one for that that outcome. Yeah, how about Gus? What, just quickly, uh, what, what have you seen similar? Uh, yeah, very similar. It comes down to the amount of the role, uh, whether it's a minority or majority, um, and then the sector expertise. Uh, if you know if if they're rolling, the, the larger the amount that they are rolling and the more that they believe that your sector expertise uh, will help make that second bite at the apple bigger, then you at least have a chance uh, at, at getting a, quote, discount to, to, the, to the high bid. In my experience, you know, I, I think there's maybe a 5% you know, good guy discount. Uh, in general, you may have the opportunity to tie. I've, I've, I've been in situations where it's like, hey, we, we really want to work with you, you know, you didn't see this, but here's the term sheet basically that I have. If you can, you know, increase to at least right. closer to this valuation, will, will you get there? But, uh, you know, I, I think it's in that 5% delta. Uh, you know, I think once, especially once you're talking bigger numbers, once it's at 10%, uh, even if even if you're the greatest guy that and, and you've got a ton of sector expertise, oftentimes uh, <laughs> high bid does tend to win. <laughs> so. Well, thank you guys. I want to go to some Q and A from our from our audience uh, members. Um, and the first one the question is going to go to Al, so be prepared, Al. I'm going to I'm going to push to the group a, a chart that we've put together, which is actually very relevant to this question. So, this is it, it's the title is somehow getting cut off here, but these are basically new funds uh, that uh, counts that have been formulated in each of these years, and. Um, you know, counting new funds is always a tricky business, so I think that the specific numbers are are, are not as important as the trend. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the question that uh, one of our audience members has asked is uh, related to a lot of the valuation and the uptick in the bid ask spread. Um, how much of this is consequence of dry powder in the market, much like it was in 2010, 2011? And moreover, how much of this dry powder issue is a consequence of LPs concentrating their capital in smaller cadre of managers, which begets even larger fund sizes. So, Al, uh, I think that's a question that I think uh, that you and I probably can answer from our vantage point. Uh, wh- wh- why don't you start off with your thoughts on the, the issue of dry powder in the market and just funds being raised in general? Um <clears throat> 
I guess uh, for us, um, you know, we do have a, a concentrated uh, portfolio. Um, our, our CIO actually puts a hard limit on, you know, the max number of managers we could ha have across the entire portfolio. Um, and and because we have that concentration issue, um, you know, we do allocate, you know, pretty big tickets, you know, big for us. Uh, to a couple, you know, a, a couple key managers or key relationships uh, in, in each bucket. Um, I think when it comes to like the the trend in new funds, um, um, you know, at least Helmsley is not contributing to this trend <laughs> because um, you know we, we you know there's uh, we want to allocate a certain dollar amount, but at the same time there's certain rules that affect uh, you know private foundations from being more than X percentage of a certain vehicle. And so for us, uh, at least in the buyout space, you know, we're, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, helping, you know, you know we're not seeding like, you know, new, like brand new startups or, or spinoffs from, from, you know, bigger P, PE firms. And so the, 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 the sweet spot for us is anywhere between $500 million funds to, to maybe up to a couple billion. And so, um, you know, I think, um, you know, clearly this trend in in the creation of new funds uh, uh, is a result of, you know, how hot private equity in the buyout space and, you know, the illiquid space in general has been. Yeah. I mean, I think we, I, we're seeing the exact same thing. I mean, one, one, another question from another audience member that's very similar in some ways is, you know, says we are sitting on a record amount of PE dry powder. Since man, this is a, from an LP. Since managers appear to have a hard time finding attractive deals, do you think prices will normalize since there appears to be an oversupply? And I would answer that um, as, n unfortunately, no. I think the opposite. I think the oversupply, again, I think Gus and Brian have done a really good job of, of, of talking about how they find edges and how they source deals um, and, and sort of navigate through a, a relatively difficult market. Uh, but I would say that the oversupply of capital, the number of new firms and funds that are being raised, um, has just created a um, more competitive environment uh, for for many of the more auctioned, less called less efficient parts of the market. And uh, you see um, more bidders for the same assets, less hit, smaller hit rates for our GPs. Um, they're spending more and more time. Uh, especially ones that don't have as focused a strategy in some ways as, as Brian and Gus have described, spending more time doing a lot of processes that end up with nothing at the end. And that can be un unbelievably frustrating but also costly to their funds. And so um, I think it's a, it's a hard market to navigate because of the dry powder. And, and um, I think the, the oversupply will continue to push up valuations until we have a macro event or some sort that changes the sort of overall valuation mindset uh, in the market. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left. I want to ask one very quick question, last question, Q&A uh, question for the two GPs, and I want one-minute answers, um, not even one-minute answers, very quick. Biggest mistake you've ever made in the sourcing process when dealing with a management team? Gus, what's a, what's a mistake that you've made at some point that you wish you never had done? Quickly. Uh Assuming that I was going to get more than a 5% good guy discount. <laughs> Fair enough. Brian, what about you? Um, I think that, that a proprietary deal is somehow going to end up being a better deal. Uh, if they, you know, team leaning into you, wanting to just do the deal with you, and, uh, uh, you know, pr probably didn't assess the team as hard as we should have because they were, you know, so pro Linden. Right. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for, for spending the time and joining us today. Um, I want to thank the audience members for, for logging in and, uh, and joining us as well. Um, you know, a couple of quick things before we end. Um, you know, hope to see everybody in a couple of weeks. I think it's about a month away uh, at the end of June. Uh, at the Super Return in Boston. Um, you can see a little slide up on the screen here uh, with a discount code as well. Um, and then the other thing um, is that, you know, for we, we really would love for folks to stay on at the end of the uh, session. There will be a feedback survey, which will pop up right after.
after the webinar ends. We'd love to hear your feedback, what you liked, what you didn't, how you would change it. Um, and I guess what I'd leave everybody with is, um, you know, uh, one of the things that as a limited partner we're always looking for are managers that can invest throughout different types of cycles. Um, you know, the, the average lifespan of a private equity firm in theory legally is 10 years, although we've never seen anybody actually uh, end up at 10 years. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, and I'm sure Al would, would sort of echo this as well, so we're always looking for managers that uh, have a process, a strategy, and the skill set to be able to navigate through different types of environments. Um, and I think that uh, I want to really thank Brian and Gus because you guys have done a great job of showing us uh, what some of the things are that GPs do uh, in a, what is generally more difficult environment to execute on your strategy. So thank you to everybody. Please stay on for a feedback survey at the end of the webinar, um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at Super Return East. All right. Thanks.